Hello Internet, and welcome to another episode of 8 Bits in the Basement. I got a box here in front of me today and I'm sure you're wondering what's in it. Well, in 1977, Tandy came out with their TRS-80, monochrome little computer. And uh, as things happen, they updated it in 1980 and came out with the color computer, which was a color version using a different processor to compete with the Commodore VIC-20. And then in 1983, they came up with the color computer 2. And that went on to 1986. And then they came out with Color Computer 3. What I have here in front of me is a Color Computer 2. The one that went from 1983 to 1986. And it was available in, in two different versions. There was a low memory version, which had uh, 16 kilobytes of RAM. And had Color Basic 1.3. So that was like the lowest version. Then there was an upgrade that could be, well, the system could be bought with the, the best of 64K of RAM and extend the basic 1.1 or you could upgrade it and the upgrade at the time in 1983 cost a lot of money but thanks to the magic of today and things being really cheap uh, it costs not a whole lot so we will upgrade it to where it should have been back in its former glory days so um that's what this video is about <laughs> so let's get cracking Here we be. This here is a Radio Shack TRS-80 Color Computer 2, which was their their second out, well, not their second out, and it's an update from the TSR-80. In fact, writing TRS-80 on it is a little bit kind of misleading because the very first TRS-80 was based on a Z80 processor from Zilog. This, however, doesn't have a Z80 processor. So the TRS-80, it stood for Tandy Radio Shack Z80. This guy here has a Motorola 6809, I believe is what's in it. And uh, for a while they toyed with the idea of calling it a TRS-90, making the, the 9 from the, from the 09 from the Motorola chip. But uh, they didn't, I suppose, re name recognition thing. And they said, okay, look, we'll go with that. But anyway, that's that. On the back of it, what we have here is we have a reset button so uh, we have our power switch to turn it on and off of course which is here and uh, we have a reset switch and uh, we also have our cassette in and out to uh, to load stuff and to record stuff onto tape we have a serial io port uh, i'm not sure if there can be a disk drive or something connected to that or a modem for sure but i'm i'm i'm, I'm not completely sure how far it goes uh, joystick ports they have two so it was a, a pretty much a gaming machine was their was their idea I suppose they've got for right and left player also there was a, a trackball that could be used using this because these are all analog so they were like true analog ports this guy here is from the American thing it's a little cover plate so you can select between channel 3 and 4 on the American version and this here would usually have an RF out but uh, this is a a European um, what you call the version, um, SCART version. So it's got a, um, not it's not really a SCART connector, but it's it's got a connector that will go to a SCART lead and give you a red, green, blue signal through your um, through your TV. So um, that's that. Uh, there's not much else to say about it on the outside apart from um, it's uh, it's one of the later revisions of uh, of this of this kind. It's one of the Korean-made ones. Uh, and it says Fairtel version, which is the um, the SCART version for the French for the French market. Um, yeah, so here we are. This the model number here is the two six five three one three four A, and uh, yeah, it's it's European, two twenty volts and fifty hertz and uh, twenty two volt amps. So that's that's that. Uh, so what we will do? Oh, it's got a cartridge port on the side of it. I almost forgot about that. So there was, um, oh, if we can see in there. So yeah, yeah, you could stick cartridges in there. There was a number of games came on cartridge. But uh, what we're going to do with it today is we're going to pop it open. We'll have a little look on the inside and see what's, what it's made of. And uh, the other little thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, upgrade the memory from 16 to 64 
and uh, mega megabytes kilobytes and we will also change the um change the rom chip inside of it so that we can use um extend the basic 1.1 and uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm planning on doing today. So we'll get cracking right into it and away we'll go. The Color Computer 2 is held together with six Phillips head screws. But um, they're not all the same. There's, uh, there's two or three different types. So the longest ones go to the back of the case and uh, the shorter ones to the front. Anyway, the top case comes right up like this. You can put that to one side. There we go. And uh, I'll just take out this last screw that I heard falling here. Here we are. Now, so the keyboard, the keyboard here is held in with a little, one of those little uh, ribbon cables, one of those little plasticky ribbon cables. And this one doesn't seem to be dry or anything. And um, there's no screws or anything because the screws are going into it from underneath. And um, I will just pop out that cable nice and carefully. And we remove the keyboard. So there we go. It's nice held together with 43 trillion screws. But uh, that's our that's our keyboard. And um, so I'll pop that over here also. Now, so inside in the case here, what we have is we've got uh, we've got our power supply here which is protect us, protecting us from instant death with a little piece of cardboard and uh, and a tie wrap because that, that apparently is shielding enough for anyone against um, 220 volts of AC current. And uh, it's supplying, whoops, it's supplying 12 and 5 volt. So we've got 12 volt, 5 volt and ground uh, coming from that into our board here. Yeah, you go down out of the way, you go over there in the way. There we go. Okay, that's that out of the way. Anyway, the chips that are interesting us today are these. They're two memory chips. These are the um the 16 uh K ones. 16 K. 16 no they're two 8K which give us 16 K. So we've got 8K and 8K. And we want to swap those out for um for 232k that'll give us 64k so it's easy enough we pull out these two we pop in the 232k and then there is a solder point here on the board which says 60 64k it's um it's right there just these two points here just need to be bridged that's all that needs to happen we put a small little piece of wire just running across the little white line there and we'll we'll tack it in at each at either side and that's it that's it, that's our uh, memory upgrade done. This one here is a little bit, well, it's not more complicated, but it's a little bit um, a little bit finickier, we'll say. This guy here is a 24-pin, um, a um, it's an 8K chip. So it's like a 27C64 or something like that. And uh, what we need to do is we need to take it out because it's in an actual socket here that'll do for 28 uh, pin chip so we can put in uh, a 27c128 which is a 16 um 16 kilobyte chip and that'll contain uh the the color basic that's on this chip plus the extended basic microsoft extended basic so what we want to do is we want to pop this out and we want to put in a reprogrammed larger 27c128 chip now um in order to let this this uh is wired up wrong for the larger chip so what they've done is they're after putting five of these little jumper guys here you can see the bridge across what says 64k here and we need to switch it back around so it goes into our 128k ones see we take out these and we just we just shift them over so that here it's gone from the top hole here to the center hole and what we're going to do is we're going to just take it out and put it from the center hole to the bottom hole across all five of them and that'll uh, bridge this connector back the way it should be so that when we pop in um when we pop in the larger chip uh, all these little little legs will go to the correct uh, hole locations so that's that's what we have to do what we're going to do is we're going to remove the motherboard 
and uh, there's only two screws holding it in but then the thing that makes it a little bit a little bit of a pain is you'll see underneath once we've taken it out there is a um like an rf shield or protective uh shield and it's kept in with about 400 million little chip little clips which are you see them here so we need to pull those we need to pull those out from the underside and uh yeah that's what we'll do we'll uh, we'll have a look at that oh yeah these two screws as well and the screwdriver here do fine for that so take these two out one and two there we go now see those screws out oh look these guys i'll take them off before i lose them there we go they'll come off it seems there we just put them there for the moment okay so this should lift up there we are that's our little motherboard and we can put this whole bottom end of the case and uh, we can move that away the power supply is power supply is is a minuscule little thing there's um there's two screws holding it in place on the underside but uh that's that's pretty much it that's it there anyway there we go so now what we got to do is we got to tackle these 53 billion of these fellas here that are on the back so i've got my little box here i can throw them into and uh and try and just grab them try and just grab them with me fingernails and pull them up as best i can and there's only one left and there we are now so we take off that with those and here we are this is the bottom of our board there we go these are the uh, the old fellas these can be easily swapped out like i was saying this here was another way that they had there was a daughter board available that had eight 41 16 chips which gave the 64 net plugged in there and they made that because memory at the time was expensive and that way it gave them an option that they could upgrade with the cheapest type of memory if it was the maybe eight of the 4116s were cheaper than uh two of the 44 uh of the 4464 anyway something like that so that's why they did that but i'm going to remove these two and then i am going to pop in the other ones and we'll solder up that little bridge point and see what that gives us now i'm just going to use a little screwdriver and place it in the bottom here if it'll go in and just ease them ever so slightly up out of their sockets there we go oops empty come that's one eased out so now we've got we've got these little feathers so we notice that this little half moon fellas down here showing us where pin one is and we need that this little um, half moon here which is designating pin one is here uh, plugs in into pin one down right and there's down where it should be this little fella go in here thing seems to be lined up not to bend any pins or to break any pins so there we are that's in place There we go. So now that's that's part one of our memory upgrade. And uh, well, I don't have to take it with my tweezers. I can uh, turn this around here like this and just measure where it'll go. We can see what kind of length we need. I reckon it around that should do it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to thin either end of it, small little bit of flux across it. We should be applying. A little solder to each end to each end of this little guy it's like a little little pair of dumbbells and this just drop her down to where we want her just now 
so that's that's one side in. And now I just add There we go. That's it. That's it done. So for next guys then we're going to um take off the five of these and swap them back over and uh, we pop in our, our new chip so what I'll do is I'll, I'll put out this here chip first and uh, then we'll go soldering and there and there and there we go that's that little fella out that's our little um our little ROM chip and change those little fellas out so what I'm going to do to change those out is quite easy I'm going to remove the 10 little solder blobs here with my trusty little solder sucker. Solder here to melt it. And there we go. Give bit of solder and melt it. There we go. into the wrong ones and solder them back we'd be kind of wasting our time wouldn't we like so you just take each each individual little um little fella little clip that we took off and uh, even if these were lost i don't think it'd matter we could use legs off of um like i used to bridge the other little fella here There we go. Yes, all we have to do is pop in the ROM chip and uh, we can put the system back together and it should, it should be good. So now this fella, we have pin one is marked down here at the very bottom. And we have our little half moon. So we turn around that way so our half moon is facing the bottom. We pin one here. Push in. There we go. He's stuck in. Now, so just a quick overview of all the chips that we're looking at here. We've got the processor, which is the MC6809 from Motorola, and it's run at 0 0.89 megahertz. Right here beside it, we've got two PIA chips. They're peripheral interface adapter chips, and they control any peripherals that are connected to um to the uh, to the system like the keyboard here which is connected through here and also um on the um on the serial io port which is a software driven port on on this system uh, you can connect a printer you can connect a modem and uh, they control that 
and um, also they control the video mode that's been used on this the video display generator as well as that we've got two memory chips here these were originally eight kilobyte each and they can be upgraded as uh, to 64 kilobytes by using two 32 kilobyte chips also there's these two headers here which uh, made it possible to uh, connect a little daughter board that had eight um eight 8k chips on it to equally bring it up to 64k uh, this guy here is what they call the sam chip it's the synchronous address multiplexer chip and it uh, sorts of memory a bit and also on top of that it controls all the timings on the system in conjunction well it it takes the frequency obviously from the from the clock here from the crystal oscillator and then it controls all the timings on the system um this here is our EEPROM, which was uh, originally a an eight kilobyte uh, containing color basic 1.3 uh, we've popped in a 16 kilobyte and upgraded it to extended basic 1.1 that's that's pretty much the system one other thing it was able or it is able to take a, a floppy disk drive also and uh, the floppy disk drive actually plugged into the cartridge port there was a, a floppy disk controller that plugged into the cartridge port here and then the floppy disk drive plugged into that and um yeah that's that's pretty much the system on top of that i mean we've we've got the keyboard connector here and we've got um a few various logic chips running around but the main the main uh work the main workload is done uh, between these these chips here lovely lovely we're after getting our upgrades done so now we're gonna have a little look and see what's after changing so the first thing to do is check if our rom upgrade is after working or not so it's as easy as just turning on the system and you see in the top left hand screen that we've got extended color basic 1.1 in the bottom right hand side we've got our original color basic 1.3 so it's as easy as that to see if the rom upgrade has worked uh, the next thing we can check quite easily if our memory upgrade is after working all we need to do is we type print mem and this will print out the memory so this works great before the upgrade because it'll give us a result of 14,631 which is correct that's our 16 kilobytes with overheads removed you know for um, for basic and screen memory and all that kind of thing if we run the same command after after the upgrade it'll give us 24,871 because now the ROM is a little bigger the extended color basic ROM is a little bigger so the overheads are a little more but what it's actually given us is it's reporting back a memory size of 32 kilobytes and um, and the reason for this is that this is a limitation of the basic used on the Coco computers and uh, I believe that even a color computer tree with 512 kilobytes or more memory will report exactly the same thing so the only way we can know for sure if our memory upgrade is is after working or not is to load up a game that needs more than 16 kilobytes of RAM so the very first game I tried is called nuclear reactor simulator so it loads with the clog command because it's an extended basic program so it loaded fine before the upgrades but it gave errors when we ran it uh, it can only run properly on the upgraded system and this is because the extended basic commands are seen as errors in plain old color basic 1.3 so then i moved on to dancing devil which isn't really a game it's more a kind of a i suppose kind of music programmy thing to, to make little character dance on screen but uh, it's written in machine code so you need to use the cload m command in order to get it load up and uh, once it's loaded we need to type exec to get it to run but anyway it's it's a strange one because it appears to need more than 16 kilobytes to run but it tries its darnest to run anyway on a 16 kilobyte system and it finishes up by crashing with a garbled mess of graphics and uh, it seems to be running perfectly on the new system Dungeons of Daggerath. 
This is a classic on the TRS-80. Again, it's a game that uses the CLOAD M command, but um, it, it needs more than 16 kilobytes to run, as before the upgrades, all we were getting was instant I.O. errors. And uh, after the upgrade, again, it appears to run perfectly. So there's our Tandy Radio Shack TSR80 Color Computer 2 upgraded and back in this little box until the next time we want to use it. Listen, thanks very much for joining me for this video. If you liked it, give us an old thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down. And uh, leave a comment if, if you wish, if there's anything you want to say or if there's anything you think or if you've used this computer in the past or I don't know, whatever. And don't forget to subscribe. Keep an eye out, there'll be another video along soon. And uh, in the meantime, take care of yourselves. Thanks for watching, bye bye.